This is for the nerds, this is for the brainiacs, this is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back, you ain't gonna touch me, you not gonna do nothing, you are not above me, I bet you wish you was me, I know it, I know What is poppin' everybody, and welcome back to another special episode of the Only Friends Podcast. Well, you know, it's me and my only friends, which includes and is not limited to my boy Tortuga. What's up? What's popping? How's it going? That was very subdued. I didn't want to yell yeah. in our friends' ears. I, yeah, so, you know, I understand. It's yeah, like, yeah. God, they mm-hmm. don't even know me, and I'm going to yell in there, their ears like that. That's there was enough right. yelling uh, on the stream last night. My God. We're, we're, you know, we, we're not talking <laughs> about the stream today. We're going to talk about some other fun stuff. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow, we will get into the stream. God, there's going to be so much to talk about tomorrow. Yes. Fully, but, fully unpacked. Uh, <laughs> other than that, like... Today we're going to be talking about some sports betting, some advantage play. We have guests in the building. My sidekick is going to hold us down. Guapo is running around right now, and I need him to switch the camera to Berkey. He forgot to light me. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Uh, yep. I was born in the dark. <laughs> uh, we're joined today by two very special guests, career gamblers, lifetime edge seekers, uh, Captain Jack and Gina Fiore. Uh, I know Gina... Much, much better than I know you, Jack. So um, I think we're going to unpack a little bit of how you got into things first. But uh, before we do that, they made a movie about you, Gina? It's just an episode. Oh, just an episode. Just an episode. Well, we've all had an episode made about us. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's not that big of a deal then. Sure, not that big of a deal, I guess. Uh, You guys are working on a, well, I don't want to be reductive. You helped found... Uh, a site called right. Unabated Sports. Uh, as best I can tell, it's a community wrapped around advantage gambling, uh, specifically sports betting, right? Specifically sports betting. Look, sports bettors are trying to find their edges. And one of the ways that sports bettors find an edge is using an odd screen. Uh, Don Best was always the popular odd screen out there. And all an odd screen is, it's line shopping. It's, it's just looking for the best price on whatever you want to bet on. And... We founded Unabated because we wanted to help sports bettors kind of get their edge. You know, a lot of sports bettors, they they don't know what they don't know. And so we have these tools and resources that help them find an edge, quantify an edge, uh, find where the best bets are, whether it's DraftKings, FanDuel, BetMGM, and uh, quantify it and then then go bet it. And uh, so, you know, the line uh, Unabated to the quarterback, right, the NFL Mm -hmm. play, uh, we feel like we're helping people get past – all the hurdles to get directly to their profits unabatedly. And so, yeah, I founded this with uh, Rufus Peabody, who's one of the, the greatest sports bettors out there. Before the show, we were talking, and I said, but how do you really know who the greatest sports better is? Because the best do it with anonymity. And right. uh, so Rufus is a little bit of a public figure, uh, but he's a genuine guy. Uh, I have a real thirst for kind of helping people understand the things that maybe they don't quite understand help them know the things they don't know. That's an understatement. And, and so we, we founded Unabated, and uh, it's been great. And there's people that are using us to uh, advance, kind of level up their sports betting prowess. So this is obviously something that you've been passionate about for a long period of time. You've been sports betting probably for decades at this point. Walk us through a little bit how you first got your toes into the water of advantage gambling, because... You know, all of us as poker players, I don't want to speak for the room, especially Conrad, but uh, <laughs> I know for Brian and myself, we've basically stuck to what we know, which is mm-hmm. poker. It's a game where mm-hmm. we know there's an edge to be sought. All you have to do is improve your skill and beat the man across the table from you. But sports and the casino, it's a lot different than that. You, you actually have to find ways to kind of manifest an edge. So what drew you into that world? So my very first trip to Vegas in the 90s, I fell in love with the vibe of Vegas. I, now, I live in New Jersey. I've lived in New Jersey all my life. I hope that the accent doesn't come through, but <laughs> I, I, does. You know, I would go to Atlantic City, and Atlantic City is such a dump, right? And I came out to Vegas for the first time, and I just fell in love with like, the glamour, the, the, the promise of it all, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I came away from that, and I wanted to find a way. How can I go to more casinos? How can I get that, you know, that first hit that I got when I went to Vegas? And I was like, well, how can I beat a casino? And I start, now back then there wasn't Google, but uh, there was like Alta Vista or something. And I was looking up how to beat a casino and you come across card counting, right? Everyone's heard of card counting. 
We've all seen Rain Man, the movie 21, all those things. And I, you know, I tried to be a card counter. I wasn't a great card counter. Gina could probably. I don't, I don't remember you. I was, I was actually going to ask you, did you ever try to count cards? Oh yeah. Oh, oh you yeah. did make but, an effort. But here's the thing. I, I made the mistake so many people make. I, I uh, was, it was ready, fire, aim. You know, I would, uh, I would just get enough knowledge and I'd run down to Atlantic City mm -hmm. and try to play some eight deck game with a three hundred dollar, three hundred dollars in my pocket, and the table minimums are fifteen dollars. You know, yeah. I had no chance, right? So this kind of, I kind of spun my wheels for a while, and then I started to think, well, what else is there? You know, there's got to be something better. And when you do that with any form of advantage play or gambling, you're always like, well, what if? There used to be commercials back in like the 80s or 90s, and I'm probably showing my age, but it was like E.F. Hutton or something like, and they said, we're always asking, what if? And I kind of do that with advantage play. I'm always asking, what if? Because every game in a casino can be beaten, every game, legally, under the right conditions. Um, but Matt, you had asked me, like, like, how did I get to the sports betting? Well, I kept asking, what if? And one of the things that led me, what if, was online casinos back in the early 2000s. It was sort of like how we see it today with all these deposit bonuses and offers, but they were even better. And technology being what it was, like you could do it and then you could go under your brother's name or mm -hmm. your friend's name and do it again. And there was no ID verification or anything like that. And you could just rinse and repeat over and over. And it was easy to build up a six figure bankroll very quickly. And so you get through that and you go, what if, what's next? Well, all these online casinos offshore, these were all offshores and some of them were very not reputable. They all had online sports books. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, what if there's something in on sports betting that I can find to exploit? And I, I lucked across something. I was one day I was poking around and I found that they had a line on home runs in each major league baseball game, but they had the same line for every stadium. Now, if you guys have watched any baseball, you know, if the wind's blowing out at Wrigley, mm -hmm. the ball's flying, right? You know, yep. Uh, back in the day, that was Candlestick Park. San Francisco's right on the bay. The wind yeah. would flow in, and there was no chance of hitting a home run. Mm -hmm. They had the same line all the way down. Wow. I'm like, well, I'll take the over at Wrigley and Coors Field, yeah. the under at Candlestick. Mm -hmm. The Reds, the Reds ballpark, like a right. lot of home runs are hit Right, there, exactly, right? exactly. So you, you get into that. I Look, this site had a $200 max on that bet. Now, I was able to kind of play on multiple accounts, but I made forty thousand dollars in oh, wow. no time yeah. on Amazing. these home run props, which yeah. were literally fish in a barrel. Did yeah. you get paid? Uh, I did not get paid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you That's can Google. Funny. You made you, hypothetical money. You can Google betonsports.com <laughs> and find this. Oh, it's a, such a crazy story. But this guy, uh, the, the U.S. had just started to crack down on this stuff, and this guy was flying from like London to San Jose, Costa Rica. And he did a stopover in Dallas. I remember this. And the feds were just waiting for him to get off the plane and grab him. And then, so years later, I was told, okay, they've, uh, they've liquidated the assets of Bet on Sports. And uh, you will get 1.8% of the money you're owed. Oh, geez. And I did. I got like a small check. And I was sure. like, hey, great. But yeah. I had cashed out some of it. So I didn't lose everything. But that's, that's what it was back then. It was like a, a Wild West. And sometimes you... You could beat them, and sometimes you could get paid. This is in the days of net teller. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we remember those days. Pre-U-G-I-A. U-G-E-I-A. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. U-I-G-E-I-A. You guys have the, like, yeah. the net teller like debit cards. Remember? I did like, not, you, no. Every I time did. I try to use it, I'd go to like, be like a Best Buy or something. They'd just look at me like funny, like, what the hell is this? I'm just like, it works. Just scan it. <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of money on net teller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was that was a scary day. I used to play bow dog a lot. Oh, okay, was, yeah. For poker, mm -hmm. that was a spot. I used to play limit too. Those games were so good. Lim back like in when was this? Oh, it's probably God. like the like mid two thousands. Yeah, yeah, like mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. and, How did you know no limit, limit games were good? Well, I was playing limit. That's what I started with. Yeah, but like, how how could you know anything was good? We were idiots back then. Like, I mean, everything I was felt I good. Was crushing. Okay. You were yeah, crushing. Was, you just play it and win every time you play. Well, I was yeah. so aggressive, so yeah. I was like cleaning up, and that's mm -hmm. when No Limit started like taking off. Because I remember they had a ten twenty, No Limit game, and I, I tried it. I mean, I I lost, and I remember randomly Dan Bilzerian used to play ten twenty No Limit, um, back in the day on Bodog, and I remember he would like talk so much shit. It's such a random story. <laughs> he would talk so much shit and chat, and I didn't. It would like, not tilt, it would tilt me. No, it, it would make me you, really mad. For sure. And then I met him in real life, and he's always been super nice to me. And I was like, how are you that 
That guy. <laughs> I mean, you could kind of see it, though. Yeah, he was, he was always nice to me in real life, but I remember just like, this guy's such an asshole. What the fuck? Yeah. Gina, did you play under a female name or? No. Because the guys would play under a female name. Like, if you saw a female right, name right, back right. then, you know yeah, it was right. like a dude, right? Yeah. No, I never did. The only time I used a female name was on BJ21.com. There used to be a blackjack message board where we'd all, this is where I met Jack, we'd all like go and talk about card counting and So it was kind of like two plus two for Yeah, for blackjack. it was really popular back then. It was the same software that two plus two used back in the day. Right. It was, oh, so awful. It was, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> every, now, everyone now is on Discord and like I, I'm kind of like, we used to do this stuff back then and then the software was horrible. Like it was just a, a thread would just disappear forever, which it's kind of like Discord, but yeah, it was. But you could uh, at least search. I don't think you could search back then. Right, right. I know somebody on BJ21, somebody would bring up something like good game condition somewhere and they don't want it to get out. So they'd, hmm? they'd start a thread or they'd make a comment about tipping because card counters always argue about tipping. <laughs> and so what was like really important would go up to like page three. It would get pushed because down. everyone's like, no, you shouldn't tip. That's your. Ed. And it would just be an <laughs> argument all the time. That's how they'd like get it out. Man. Pretty sure. Yeah. yeah sharps being sharp uh i i want to pull with the thread a little bit more about like how you guys met and everything but before i do i i have a little bit of a sports betting question so you know you guys are both familiar with the poker market especially the online market and how gray and black it's become i mean we barely have regulated poker mm -hmm. now that sports betting has become regulated a little bit more and it's been regulated offshore for you know decades at this point how much are you delving into let's call it the gray market being overseas where you know as somebody in the united states you're not technically supposed to be getting accounts there mm -hmm. uh versus the black market of just like you know having a bookie on speed dial type of stuff how, how much is that still occurring in today's market a lot because the regulated market has they have those limits you know you hear any sharp better any really any sports better mm -hmm. you hear they complain that you know i got limited at DraftKings, i got limited at wherever and that's kind of to the detriment of regulated sports betting. And it's not so much that they limit you to a couple hundred dollars per bet. They limit you to like $5. $3 yeah. a bet. $3? Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, it'll, what, it'll be like three twenty six. Right, It'll be something <laughs> rare. Because <but> <laughs> right? these are all European yeah. companies. And on the back end, it's all being done in, uh, you know, Swedish currency mm -hmm. on the decimal uh, point betting system. And so... To translate to the U.S. odds, it comes across as, you know, maybe they've limited you to $5 in Sweden, but it's actually $3.26 mm -hmm. right. here. And so it just seems so disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. Why do they care so much about sharps? Like, are, isn't the whole purpose of a book to charge enough VIG where they get action on both sides and then just make the, the percent? They don't want to balance the action. That's kind of one of those myths of sports betting is okay. they're not looking to balance the action. They're actually looking to know what the sharp side is and encourage people on the other side. I call it the square side, but... Mm -hmm the other side to bet into that. Uh, but when you, when you limit the sharps, when you make it $3 and I'm, 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 I'm offended by it and I leave and I, you know, I post about it on Twitter, you lose the signal of the sharp, you know, maybe if they would have limited me to $500, I would say, yeah, I, $500 a pop. Okay. That's fine. I'll play there and I'll play it 10 other places. And that's great. And they would get my signal. They would know, oh, Jack's on this game. Oh, Jack thinks this is the sharp side. Oh, Jack thinks this line is something that he bet into. Therefore, we better look to maybe move it and adjust it. And, but you lose that. And you know what I do? I come in as somebody else. I get a friend to say, hey, sign up at this sports book. You play there. I'll tell you what to bet. And they don't know that guy's sharp. They know who mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. And so now they lose that signal. So it, it actually works against them. Yeah, definitely. Also, they, they limit non-sharps. Like all the time, mm -hmm. like all the time. It's bad business. It's just bad business. A quick That's example I have of you from that is uh, in 2019, sports betting opened up in Pennsylvania and I knew this guy, Complete Square. He was a huge Yankees fan. And so the season opened up, the, the uh, Yankees were playing the Orioles and the Orioles at that time, historically bad. They mm -hmm. were gonna be like a, a horrible team. And so the first day, the line opened up on the Yankees and it just increased from there. Well. As soon as that line was available, he bet it. He's a huge Yankees fan, right? And then the next day, he did the same thing. And the next day, he did the same thing. Well, everybody else was betting the Yankees, and the sports book had to adjust. So they're moving that line each day. So at the end of three days, he has what's, what's called closing line value. In other words, he's got a better bet 
than what the efficient market closed at at game time. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they kind of measure that and say, oh, this guy must be sharp because he's got closing line value. He was just a complete Yankees fanboy. <laughs> and as a result, they limited him four days into the season. Jeez. Because they said, well, this guy must know something. Mm -hmm. No, he knows that he loves the Yankees. He's yeah. going to bet him at any price. Right. You know, whatever, whatever price. Here, let's throw my money at it. Not to get off track or anything, but I'm looking at your site and I'm <laughs> thrown by how like like how much difference there is in some of these lines. It's mm -hmm. like up to fifty cents difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty absurd. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a lot of difference on all these lines. And here's the thing about sports betting these days, right? Surface area, you know, like the sports book has the edge because they can charge a vig, Matt, like you were saying. Yeah. But the better has the edge because the, can, the better can choose what they want to bet or not bet. And these sports books these days, in order to gain a bigger audience, are expanding this, the surface area. So they're putting up props. They're putting up new markets. They're putting up, look, you, there was slap fighting yeah. oh, last yeah. night, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. You can bet on slap fighting You can bet $1,000 yeah, on was, slap geez. fighting. That was a lot. I was surprised. Yeah. How do you thousand. find a good line on slap betting? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, don't, I, I watched five minutes of it. I was like, yeah. what are we doing? <laughs> Someone will figure it out. Right. There's one woman that's been working on it like publicly, um, and she was getting down like $1,000 downtown, and I was shocked. Wow. And I was like, well, how much data do you have? Like how much history? And she had four events. You know what I'm talking about. Yep, yep. And she yeah. went six and two last night. Oh, did she? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not going to give away her methodology, methodology but yeah, I, I think she's going to do well, at least for a while. Nice, yeah. But so the point is the surface area, there's more and more surface area. So Conrad, you're looking at our screen and you see all these different bet types and we got prop screens and we got teaser tools and we got the odd screen for sides and totals and five inning lines and first quarter lines and all these things. It's mm -hmm. surface area, man. And you know, you pick off little bits here and there in the, the grand surface area and they start to add up fast. It's sort of like, you know, back in the day you could sit in a poker lobby online and you could just kind of watch for the games where somebody sat down right. that you know you want to jump in that game. Well, that's sort of like now. You kind of sit in our lobby and you look for the times when, oh, there's something that's vulnerable. Grab it and then go back into the lobby and wait again. It's, that's, you know, Basically I used to do it. that playing online. How, well. how do you get volume in then if uh, the, the game is essentially not being detected versus... And I mean, this will carry us into the blackjack conversation uh, with Gina, but like, how, how do you possibly do this for a living if... Uh, the entities that be are trying to shut you down at all costs because there's more and more entities coming into the ecosystem mm -hmm. you can still play offshore you can yeah. still play with your local bookie um my you know my evolution is i went from playing offshore and then going oh well these these local guys i'm in i'm in jersey there's there's a guy on every corner there's jersey basically. joe on every corner right right <laughs> and i kind of i kind of worked my way through all of them and they they all got to, got to know me and then i was kind of blacklisted with them and so then i had a, a friend in florida and he would just get me accounts in florida and so we'd, we'd bet through florida and you just kind of you evolve it i said the science of sports betting the art of sports betting that's the art of sports betting getting down finding ways to make yourself look square to the sports book so that they go oh this guy he bet a, he bet a bunch of parlays yep. he can't he doesn't know what he's doing. You know, I had, a w I had a way to beat that same game parlay, you know, that all the sports books now have the same game parlay because it's a huge edge for the sports book. They don't factor in the correlation of the bets. The, the, the bettors don't factor in the correlation. The bettors think they're getting the best of it on these lines. And they're getting the horrible. sports books are getting, yeah, the sports books are making a ton of money off them. And I found one that was kind of exploitable. And so I started betting it. And all of a sudden, the limits on every other sport I bet at that sports book all went up. Right. They were like, oh, this guy's a sucker. He's betting a same-day right. parlay. Therefore, we'll give him bigger limits, and we'll take more of his money. Because mm -hmm. if they think you're a sucker, the sky's the limit on, on how much it'll take. And if they think you're sharp, then it all comes crashing down. So, I have a, go ahead, a go couple ahead, questions. Yeah. Sorry. Um, if you're a top-tier sports better, if your ROI is 4%, 5%, are you absolutely crushing? Like, What kind of ROI can you expect as, as, a, as a really good sharp? Yeah, so, so there's multiple ways to be a sharp sports better. There's the two terms we use are top down and bottom up. Now, I'll start from the back end. Bottom up means you're, you're modeling everything, you're kind of coming up with your own, you're originating your numbers, you're handicapping, you're, you're picking the winners that way by, by your own origination. Top down is kind of what I was describing here, where you, you find a sharp source in the sports betting world. Uh, and, you know, unabated, we have an unabated line where we're, we can be your sharp source. 
of this is what the line should be. And then you find inefficiencies in the market where, okay, that price is off by 2.5%, 3% here and there. And with volume, you just find enough of those plays each day and it, it adds up quickly. And uh, so you said, you know, what would be the ROI for a sharp better? Well, yeah, for somebody who's like top tier. For top tier, if they're doing bottom up, it's really hard to be more than like 55 to 57%, which compared against the, the average line being minus 110, which is around 52%. So you're talking about that's like a, a 7 to 10% edge. And that's top tier. So in order to make $100,000 a year, you have to be placing how many? You have to be placing like a million, like a million dollars in yeah, bets? Yeah, a million. More than that. Yeah. In fact, I, I have a video on YouTube, how to make $100,000 a year at sports betting, and it's not clickbait. Yeah. It's basically kind of it's walking like, you through, here's down. what you would need to do. Here's how you would scale it up. Here's how you would scale it out. And yeah, it's, but it's, it's all about volume. It's all about, uh, you know, you talk to like a day trader, Mm -hmm. And they're getting in and out of positions every day, right? right. They're, they're doing a lot just based on little movements and getting in and out over the course of the day. Not that I think day trading is a, is a good way to make money. I think the taxes eat you up. But that's sort of what sports betting is in terms of finding the little edges, picking off a little edge here and there. Look, we got guys that, that sit on an odd screen 16 hours a day. I don't advise doing that, but <laughs> they're making a ton of money. Like, because of volume. Because of volume, because well, of discovering new ways to get down, of discovering how to scale their operation, and you know, it was, just keeps on growing. I was just going to say that if you're the first person to find something, that's huge. And like, what I like to do is read the terms and conditions of like every site, because you'll find like something that they did wrong, like maybe something you can exploit. Something you can exploit, yeah. Like they're they're not factoring. I'm trying to think of somebody beat baseball and they did a thread on it. You know oh, what I'm talking about? What the was ninth the inning line stuff, right? Yeah. So there right. was a bet. Will there be a bottom of the ninth inning? Right, right, right. Okay. So if there's a if there's a bottom of the ninth inning, means the the road team is winning or the road team's ahead, and so he modeled it and he was able to bet that while the game was going on. So he had a better way of kind of judging, and the sports book wasn't adjusting. And it was that the line. only one. It was the only sports book that was like not doing it correctly, and mm -hmm. he just. It's just looking at the terms and conditions and looking at like every, every menu, every betting menu. Yes. Yeah. And then if I can, I have two more questions. Sorry. Um, in terms of bankroll management, I've heard that betting up to 2% of your bankroll is actually kind of not smart. That once you hit about 1%, 1.5%, that's starting to get a little risky. Is that correct? So here's the thing about bankroll management, bet sizing. You guys are card players, right? There's mm -hmm. 52 cards in a deck. That's very finite math that goes into your edges. Sports betting, anything can happen. On any given Sunday, anything can happen, right? So while you can have quantifying your edge, you cannot be certain about your quantification of that edge. And as a result, you have to factor that into your bet sizing. So I'm sure you're all familiar with Kelly Criterion, you know, betting your edge. So if I had a 4% edge, I'd wanna bet 4% of my bankroll. But with sports betting, you can't really do that because you can't exactly know that you absolutely have a 4% edge like you could playing in cards. So what you do is you do a quarter Kelly or a half Kelly, and that's exactly what it sounds like. You divide by four. So instead of betting 4%, you bet 1%. But here's the thing that I always tell people about sports betting, especially if you're doing it in that top-down methodology where you're finding inefficiencies, inefficiencies in the market, it's all about speed, okay? So just find a bet size that's comfortable, that is not too risky for you. You know, I like to say like 1% or even lower than that. And when you see that edge, bet it. You know, because yeah. it's not going to be there long. So rule of thumb, you wouldn't be out of line just saying no more than 1%. Rule of thumb, correct, yes. Okay, and then final question. Sorry, how much money did you put on the uh, Floyd Mayweather-McGregor fight? <laughs> <laughs> I had, that was the biggest bet I've ever made in my career. It's the same right? here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was a little bit of a sweat in like the second round. I, I almost got sick. I went into the backyard because <laughs> I completely emptied my bankroll to, to, uh, mm -hmm. to bet on Floyd. Yeah, no, that was... And then, then you could, could tell, like, he's just toying with him. You know, it was, oh, that was such a beautiful moment. Because here's the thing. Every sports book in the world says, you know, well, we'll only take so much. And, but when it came to that, that fight, because they had so much action on McGregor. Yeah, he started at minus 2,500. Right. They were begging. Floyd, like, yeah. Floyd started at minus 25. I ended up getting him, like, at minus 55, I think. Minus 55 or minus 6,500. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, look, the, the line kept dropping because all the McGregor money was coming in. And I'm not sure... To this day, you can't really find people that said, oh, I bet on McGregor. No, but <laughs> <laughs> revisionist history bet on Mayweather. Well, yeah. that's, that's because you're in a sharp space. Like, every poker player in the world bet on 
I mean, I didn't bet at all, but and I'm sorry I didn't. But every every poker player in the world bet on uh, Mayweather. But if you go to the general populace, like McGregor is so popular, I'm sure that there were people just firing off. And it's one of those things where the whole reason why I didn't bet is because I don't trust boxing at all. Mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. if ever the fix is going to be in, it's going to be here for everyone to just take a bath and go broke. And get the rematch. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. It's like there's so much money involved here and like I'm not going to trust because – you know, I had really intelligent people like firing ninety percent of net worth on this. Just like <laughs> yeah. no hesitation whatsoever. This is the the, the sharpest line of all I time. I mean, if you, if you have a bigger edge, not saying that you can quantify that or it was ninety percent, but you should bet more, or it's not wrong to bet more. Right? Yeah, if yeah, you have yeah, a yeah. Bigger edge. Yeah, of course. Sure. Um, uh, la- last question in sports betting before we uh, kind of delve a little bit into Gina's background. But um, how far do you carry this into other markets? Like, do you bet politics? Do you do DFS? Do you, do you go into all of those landscapes? It's tough to bet politics in the U.S., but offshore and in Europe, mm-hmm. betting on the U.S. political system is huge money. There's yeah. so much money out there. You guys have probably all heard the Paul, stories. I, I can get you a lot of big free bets whenever the election comes around. <laughs> <Right. out. laughs> right. Poker players love to bet politics. I dabbled in predict it for a while. Right, that's what I was yes. going to say. Yeah, predict yeah, yeah. it. Yes. Yeah, I, I, especially like during the pandemic and like everything was going on. And uh, yeah, because I, I was interested in politics and I won some money and I lost some money. But it's, 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 it's interesting because it's not just like, you know, it's not just like there's a line. It's more of like a stock market kind of thing. And you buy shares and and everybody's so confident of their bet mm-hmm. so right like, yeah yeah for sure you know like there's a point where in mayweather mcgregor you said i don't know if i'm confident in this it could be rigged right you know that's why i'm not t-. but when it comes to political betting no my guy's gonna win the 100 percent. the yeah. market for biden yeah. trump was one of the most insane things i've ever witnessed as an observer <laughs> like I, again, I wish I had a little bit of courage. I just, I have a real problem, like, putting my money behind something I have no real knowledge. Well, it's not even that. Like, whatever. We take risks all the time. But when I'm not that knowledgeable with something, like, I feel knowledgeable in poker. So I feel like I have some control over the outcome, even though I know there's some variance in chance. But when it comes to, like, betting sports, betting politics, and knowing that I have a slanted bias towards whatever is going to drive me to make that bet... I don't really want to put any big money down. It's like, well, I hate mm-hmm. Trump. So, of course, I, I think he's just going to get absolutely washed in the election. And I watched the market form, and you can just see the inefficiencies if you're, if you're at all sharp well, because yeah. everybody thinks that way. On predicted, was, oh, uh, I was going to say, yeah, on predicted, uh, they, like, they left the market the open when, when after the, the election was in. over. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. pretty much when it was already over yeah. because... You know, Trump was saying, oh, they're going to overturn this. And they're like, well, we don't know. So we're just going to leave it open. So there was like a free 10% just on every single Mm -hmm. market. It Mm -hmm. was amazing. Going back when it was Trump and Hillary, the results were coming in. It looked like Trump was going to win. It was still plus 200 Trump offshore. And I was like, that's crazy. Yeah, it was insane. Mm -hmm. I was watching it real time and I didn't have any money to bet (laughs) offshore. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that was another instance where poker players got rich was after the election had closed. The amount of money that I saw get down at like 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 that Biden would retain the the presidency was insane. Mm-hmm. It was just mm-hmm. insane. I'm watching hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> get down that somehow yeah. Trump is going to be the president right. in March of 2017. Yeah, yeah. And it's like... I mean, 2020 or, yeah. or 2020 yeah, yeah. it's like what yeah. what is going on here like I, and i guess that kind of speaks to you know we talk about it all the time uh applying game theory to live poker it gets a little bit gray because the the premise of game theory is that you have rational actors and the second that that breaks down the whole the whole market kind of collapses and you're kind of free to do whatever makes the most sense to make the most money and in this instance it was giving some Yahoo 20 to one that truly believed that by March of 2020, Mm -hmm. everything was going to be overturned and Trump was going to return to office. Yeah. When, Oh, sorry. When your edge is so high though, you don't need to quantify it. Right. Right. Like once it gets, yeah. Like in blackjack, you, you know, the whole card, you know, your edge is whatever, 5%. Yeah. Now, you know, the next card, like you don't have to do the math. It's more more than 5%. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 It does make a lot of sense. Wow. Um, let's talk a little bit about your history. So I've known you since I moved out here. I always thought... What year did you move out here? 2008. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we were battling. Yeah, we were battling a lot. Yeah. 
That was fun. <laughs> I enjoyed playing Is this in the live streets? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we played a lot of Uncapped No Limit. Mm. The, I, I, very, I remember a very specific hand. We were playing at Aria 1020. And uh, I had three bet pocket eights out of the blinds you called. And the board came like king jack nine or something along those lines i bet three streets you called three streets we both showed down pocket eights <laughs> and at that point i was just like okay one of our egos is too big yeah, yeah. and i'm not sure who's <laughs> i don't remember that hand but it sounds yeah. Uh, it was, yeah it was very spot on but yeah we battled a lot i always thought you were one of the sharpest players in the pool just because especially back then aggression won so right easily yeah it and people didn't put it together yet. No. That was like the my... Only, the only two players I remember from that time period are you and Billy. And it was just because of the aggression, aggression. factor. Yeah. And it, and it worked. Like I used Course. to do really, really well. And it was just... And then they think you're like a fish when you're putting... When you're three betting the King 7 suited. Whatever. Back in 2008, they, they weren't there. No. They're just like, oh, she's, she's horrible. I want to play in her game. It's yeah. like, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I would talk with Brian all the time. I would just be like, I have a very simple strategy. I just put a bunch of money in until they raise. And put a lot of yeah. pressure. And then I just fold. <laughs> like right. they, they raise, they have mm -hmm. it. And, fold. and that didn't work with like you and Billy because it was just like this back and forth of seeing who could get the last bet in, yeah. which definitely challenged me a lot. It made me rethink a lot of things strategically. But um, poker wasn't your only endeavor. I, I only knew you as a poker player. I didn't realize right. that you were involved in so much other stuff until later when the story of the um, civil forfeiture came out. Which right. maybe we can start with that story since it has to do with the Bahamas and, you know. Yeah, are they are they doing another tournament in Bahamas? They are, right? WPC? Every year they do PCA still. Right. Uh, and, then, and now the WSOP is oh, doing WSOP. a winter WSOP there. I, it's... It sucks. I mean, I don't like it there. None Everything's expensive. Yeah. The mm -hmm. casino Tourist trap. is really cold. I remember being freezing <laughs> the entire time I was there. Everything's expensive. You got to travel so far. I like the Bahamas. The yeah. only the only thing I think that is beneficial to the Bahamas is that it draws really well from the East Coast, and that is where the majority I mean, of the liquidity comes that from. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, Florida is literally a puddle jump away. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a total tourist trap. Atlantis is awful. Yes. Uh, the yeah. only thing that makes a little bit of sense is Caesars is a, a sister pro or a partner with Atlantis, I guess. So, like, if you're Diamond Plus, you do get some free rooms. But I highly doubt you're going to be able to cash them in during that time. Yeah, I don't like the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> you don't but like yeah. it for a different reason. <laughs> well, no. And so traveling people always have a story. Every year somebody has a story and then they tag me on Twitter because someone either got their money confiscated or they were in a back room at the airport for, like, two hours or whatever Jeez. the story is yeah it, it doesn't seem worth the trouble i don't know are the tournaments soft i don't know pca is great mm -hmm. um it's it's a tournament worth traveling for whether or not you want to go spend 14 days in the bahamas is right. a different story right. but it does you know it's the winter time it is kind of we all wish aussie millions would just come back it'd be way better i'd rather fly 16 hours there than five yeah. hours to bahamas to be quite honest but um Specifically with the civil forfeiture, you ended up winning this case, if I'm correct, right? We didn't. So, so we were flat. We went Vegas to Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. We started with like, you know, we started with our bankroll, our playing bankroll, whatever that was, 30k, and then we went to Atlantic City playing blackjack. And we won, you know, 40k, let's call it. So now we have 70. And then we go to Puerto Rico, which is a U.S. territory, mm -hmm. and so we don't declare because it's U.S. territory, and we know this. Like we used to play in Puerto Rico a lot. We won like another 30, let's say. So now we're traveling. It was, that's what it was. So we're traveling with 100K back home. And I had 30K in my bag. We we're going through TSA and I just had a random bag check. It wasn't anything other than that. And so they saw 30K cash and they brought us, TSA brought us into a, like a little side room. And uh, they're like, you know, where'd you get the cash? And I was like, well, we're at the casino. I told the truth. I'm like, we're at the casino, we're gambling. And, uh, and he said, and I said, I, I, isn't it legal to carry, you know, money in the United States? Like, you don't have to declare it. I just wanted, I just wanted him to say it. And so he was like, yeah. And uh, he said, if you're, if you're not being true with me, like, if you're, if you're lying to me, we're going to extradite you back to Puerto Rico. I'm like, Puerto Rico is part of America. <laughs> yeah, what are you talking <laughs> about? But I was like, okay. Right. And then he said, don't be surprised if somebody talks to you, you know, when your plane lands. Okay, cool. So we had a connection in Atlanta. And... 
we connect in Atlanta and we get off the flight. Um, my partner goes to the restroom. I go get a cup of coffee and uh, the DEA calls my name behind me. And so I turn around and I'm like surrounded by like, they have DEA agents like posing as travelers. Like this guy's got a backpack on and there's a woman, you know, and then it's a DEA agent. Basically they surround us and they check everything, all our bags and they see we have a hundred K. It's like jackpot for them. So um, they're like, where'd you get this money? And my partner at the time, Keith Gibson, he plays poker. Yep. He, yeah. 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 My partner at the time didn't say anything. He didn't say a word and he was smart. And I was over there with my trip logs and my results. I'm like, no, we stayed here. And we stayed, you know, yeah. or whatever. And it didn't matter. They were just going to take the money. So they took the money and they didn't let us count it. They just had like plastic bags. They're like, put your money in here. And so I'm like, Keith, let's write how much about we have. Like we wrote on the bag, like 30K, 70K. But they took like every dollar we had and uh, and they brought like the dog out before they took it, you know. And they're like, the dog got a hit. And the dog, I'm like, the dog's falling asleep. The dog did nothing. <laughs> the dog made no movement whatsoever. Right. Even if it did, it's not Jeez. reliable. Yeah, so they took all our money and then we flew to Las Vegas and our lawyer, because I called him on the, I, I called him on the flight out of Puerto Rico. I said, can you meet us in Vegas? Because I think they're gonna talk to us. So he's, at Ve he's in Vegas like waiting for us. We get off the flight and uh, they, they kept our luggage, but they wouldn't say they kept it. They were just like, we lost your luggage, you know, come get it tomorrow. So, but the guy, the DEA agent, the DEA agent was like, you know, if you can prove what you're saying is true when you get back, you know, we'll give you your money back. And so I put, you know, I, I don't know if I was putting gambling winnings or I, I think I was still doing a schedule C. I was doing a schedule C. So I had professional gambler taxes and I think Keith did too. So we sent all that, our lawyer did, and they wouldn't give the money back. And then his excuse was that, uh, we gave like aliases or we weren't truthful about who we were, something like that. Keith said nothing. I was the one with my records. So anyway, and then they were like, well, uh, like six months later, if you take a lie detector test, we'll give you the money back. And I was like, fuck you. No, <laughs> yeah, like it's like, our money. Yeah. yeah. It's not reliable. Like, no, no. And I was like, not that it's a lot of money, a hundred K, but I'm like, I'm still working. Like, you know, we're not doing that. And then the next thing, like two months later was if you sign something that you won't sue, we'll give you the money back. I was like, no, like, no. And so then the, what is it the district attorney somebody in georgia higher up saw the case and was like this is bullshit and they gave us our money back and then we sued immediately we were like illegal search and seizure and we got our money back so it wasn't going to be like like uh we weren't going to make money off the case but we wanted to prove a point mm -hmm. like you can't do that i couldn't right. believe it happened yeah. either so wild i was like how are you just taking our money i was sh i was shocked i was very naive so we sued and we sued the DEA agent because the DEA has immunity. So we sued the agent and we sued him in Nevada because even though it happened in Georgia, this is where uh, we were affected. Like right. Nevada lost that money. We live in right. Nevada. Yeah. And so they threw it out like pretty quickly. And then uh, he appealed. No, we appealed. It went to the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit oh, wow. agreed with us. They're like, you can sue in Nevada. Awesome. And then he appealed to the Supreme Court. like the the Supreme Court of the United States, like the Supreme Court. And, uh, and they hear like, I don't know, they get like 5,000, something like that, like cases like appealed and they take 50, I don't even know, like something really, really it's, small. It's not, yeah. It's, yeah. It's a very and small so they, they yeah. took our case. And so this it's happened wild. in 2006, 2014, we're at the Supreme Court. And so now we're arguing over jurisdiction. Like this happened to you here. Can you sue in Nevada? And I guess, uh, and we lost, we lost nine zero. Like we just mm. lost. And we had a we had a great Supreme Court lawyer, but anyway, I guess it was a big deal for jurisdiction um, for big companies like their employees where they can sue. Like that was the thing, and so so we lost that part of it, but we got our money back. And I guess it's like part of the syllabus in law school when you first go in. Like they talk about jurisdiction and they cite our case. I've had so many lawyers come up to me and be like, or DM me, be like, yeah, we learned about your case, you know, in law school wow. or whatever. But then we could have sued in Georgia. And it would have just been to make a point. Yeah. Like you can't. And so at that point, it was eight years later. I couldn't find a lawyer that was, I don't want to say passionate, but who cared anything about this. And then we would have had to pay the money just to find out if the statute of limitations was over because we had been, you know, it had been eight years. Mm. So I let it go. I just let it go. And uh, so, yeah, we lost. We lost These jurisdiction, but we got our money back. These civil forfeitures and, and illegal search and seizures are like really 
commonplace it seems with poker players specifically mm -hmm. well right it it's a free roll for them and they right. get the money like the money goes to their department the money goes it goes in like a slush fund right yeah right yeah. and yeah. the the dea agent was actually a cop acting as a dea agent and i heard that he was never a dea agent again and i think i'm not sure i've googled i think he was like a campus police officer <laughs> oh I my think. god he's i could be he's wrong a mall that. cop but uh, mm -hmm. right, but it's it's a free roll. Like we're we're gonna take your money. Nothing's gonna happen to us. And if you can't prove where you got it, like I had tax returns, I had a a letter from my CPA. You know, she's a professional gambler. A letter from my lawyer, and I didn't have a record. Like imagine if I was like 19 years old and I got caught with like pot or something. Right. They'd be yeah. like, well, she has a history of this, mm -hmm. so it has to be drug money. Yeah. So not everybody has, and I had to pay 10k to get the money back. Not everybody has the resources. Yeah. Right? It's just yeah. it's fucked up. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. All it is. How much of that goes into this? Uh, what, 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 what is the show? Explain. There's a series called Sports Explains the World. Okay. Metal Arc Media. Mm -hmm. The president, the ex president of ESPN, started his own Metal Arc Media company, and he wanted to do something comparable to 30 for 30 okay. at his new company. So it's Sports Explains the World, and it's, it's you know, different. There's like a kid's soccer team and like a soccer team from Ukraine who had to like enlist in the war, different sports stuff. And, uh, and so they considered, the director really pushed for this, like gambling is a sport, which it is. And so they, um, yeah, it's an episode of the series and it's just about my career, card counting. Okay, so uh, for, did you guys cover the, the uh, seizure? No. We didn't. Man, that's such an interesting part yeah. of it, in my opinion. It is. It's. I mean, it was 25 minutes long. We couldn't. We had oh, to focus on something. It's yeah, like, yeah, what yeah. are we gonna do? Mm -hmm. And so it was like me having a team. Me. How did you start card counting? And then I had right. a team, and and now I'm a mom. It just kind of went like that. So your first introduction to gambling as a whole was blackjack. Yes. Then where did you branch off into? I think it was blackjack. I was working in Palm Springs as a dealer, and I played poker at Morongo. I was playing three six limit so i guess that was my next thing and then i was counting cards and i was playing more poker so i would drive to commerce and play 612 limit um so that i guess poker was the next thing yeah you and then, miss poker yeah i do i totally do. i've i have lately because there's like a poker boom kinda. right yeah sort of a and then I'd get in those spaces about like all the cheating and all the, <laughs> and the Nick Airball. And I'm like, oh, I want to go play. Um, yeah, I miss it lately. We'll get you back in there. Yeah. And back now you streets. are sports betting. Mm -hmm. And you're doing yeah. that full time? I would say like 80% sports betting. Yeah. Okay. It's, there's a lot of, like we're saying, there's a lot more. Like there's a sports betting boom basically it's like mm -hmm. money maker yeah, yeah. so there's so many like options so <clears throat> there's a competitive market because you have to compete right yeah um so yeah and i could do it from home which how, is nice how small and tight niche is this kind of like sharp sports betting community i mean it seems like you two have known each other for decades yeah uh how like parallel to poker how how tight niche is it is it similar to like the no. two plus two community or it's 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 smaller it's harder to be i think okay i think sports betting is a game of skill like poker is a game of skill yeah mm -hmm. and i would never encourage anyone to go play blackjack like i just would like i hate casinos they're awful <laughs> but i think sports betting is a game of skill and i understand how it's entertainment like i get it so i don't have a problem promoting don't lose as much or like learn how to bet sports but i think it's harder to beat than poker would you agree yeah you know i knew the question was going to come up today i think mm -hmm. it's harder i do think it's harder i do think it's also i think it's deeper and that's not an offense to anybody that's doing poker right now but there's just so many layers to what you need to do to get down to get the money down in sports betting that it's it's similar to and i brought it up earlier like table selection yeah to me it sounds similar to like being able to get into high stakes private games yes yes mm -hmm. i think that's right a good it's analogy. like uh i imagine that there are a lot of quants that can model and beat sports yes and i would compare them to like on online high stakes grinders that are just going to take the toughest environment in the world and find an edge mm -hmm. uh and then you have everybody else who's just competing for dumb money in public i think that's changing though because there's so much competition and now 
I think unabated is like card runners. Okay. Like card runners was the mm -hmm. first on the scene basically. Right. Yeah. And I think unabated, there's no site that compares. I know this sounds shilly, but there's no site <laughs> no, that compares sure way. Yeah, good. <laughs> to unabated because there are so many tools. Like I'm not building models. I'm not at home. Like with my Excel sheet, like I'm not doing that. I'm using the tools. Like, um, there's a teaser tool. I've never been a teaser in my entire life, but unabated has had a teaser tool that made it easy to find profitable teasers. And, you know, I had a 13% ROI on, on a college basketball teasers and we got a lot of action. I mean, we got, mm -hmm. we got a lot of action down yeah. and, uh, and it was a 13% ROI and that wasn't, you know, maybe it was really 8% through whatever, but, yeah. um, it wasn't a fluke. And so there's so much available that if you have the wits about you, I guess you don't have to model, you don't have to like, figure out your own projections, but they're giving you tools where the common man right. can like figure out how to beat sports betting. Mm -hmm. How much of your time on the site is spent uh, building out tools and resources as opposed to like actual training content? So I am the head of content okay. and I spend all my time trying to build the community, explain to people the complexities of sports betting, try to help them uh, to be sharper betters, but we have an engineering team. We have a data science team. Uh, we're a legitimate startup. We're not just a couple guys that have this, you know, server running in the cloud somewhere. We have a full staff of people that are very skilled in what they do. Uh, they've built other products in the past, uh, Sports Insights, Fantasy Labs. They became the Action Network. Then the Action Network got sold to, uh, you know, for like $240 million. Mm -hmm. But that's not my goal. My goal is not to kind of run this up and sell it off. My goal is, I think we need a legacy product within the sports betting world. This is how I met Jack. We're on bj21.com. You're a little bit older than me. I was like 22 years old. I knew nothing. I would ask the dumbest questions about card counting. Like the, the <laughs> dumbest shit. Like I would just, and Captain Jack would give, and to everybody, he'd just give a, a wall of text of an answer. That was just his thing. And 20 years later, he's still doing it. Like he's <laughs> yeah. on Discord 24-7. Yeah. Somebody it's, asks a question, it's like wall of text from Captain Jack. That's great. It's totally negative EV here, though. You know, like <laughs> right. explaining how to do something mm -hmm. to somebody else and they go do it doesn't help me. No, right. Of course. I don't know. It just, it's just, <clears throat> it's my altruism. It's the same thing poker training sites, right? Like right. I mean, when you, you make a, a, a training site like we have, like it's it kind of like is negative EV in a way because you are teaching the community how to play and that's the people you're going to be playing against. Yeah, I think you just ra well, it's different in poker. You just raise the floor, like yeah. you you lessen. <laughs> uh, on some regards, like it may seem like you're making everybody around you sharper, but really what you're doing is you're lowering the barrier of entry for new players. Yes, and that's a big big deal in poker. It's probably less of a big deal in sports betting. Not so much. We look sports betting as it is today is probably not sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's like a race to the bottom. Right. These, these sports books are not making money because they're spending right. so much on marketing and customer acquisition, and it's not a sustainable product. You know what happens if we do it this way? We'll wind up like Europe did, where there's really only two or three sports books, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. two or three monolithic sports books, and the rest of it is nothing. Which, and then they just clamp down on everybody. And you know, sports betting in Europe is horrible. And I, wanted, I didn't want to see that happen in the US. Sports betting's been in the US for 50, 60 years. It's not anything new. It's just we now have it regulated in all these other states, and it's becoming popular, but it still needs to be sustainable. We still need to make sure that 20, 30 years from now, we have a vibrant sports betting market, a sports betting ecosystem, something where people can say, oh, yeah, I'm going to take my shot at sports betting. Just like we could have had that with poker, right? You know, if we would have regulated poker back in the poker boom, it would be a different story today. Yeah. Well, so my point with like unabated, not everybody wants to be a winning sports better. Like it's entertainment. But if you don't have basic poker strategy you don't want to go play sundays that's your like day to go play poker and just dust off money yeah, yeah. every mm -hmm. sunday yeah. just yeah. every sunday you yeah. lose because you don't know how to calculate your odds or mm -hmm. you don't you know whatever so at the very least like at least recognize these odds are better like i'm going to log into all these apps i'm going to look at uh, an odd screen like you don't have to just go give it away and that mm -hmm. adds up like if you're playing one two on the weekends that's your like fun hobby and you're like dusting off know three hundred dollars a weekend like that adds up yeah so uh yeah so i look at it as like definitely entertainment but anyone anyone you can you can beat sports betting it's a skill game mm -hmm. it's just like poker i just mm -hmm. i think it's like poker 
how, put enough work into it. Yeah. How collaborative yeah. is the the sports betting industry as opposed to individualized? Whenever it comes to let's call it the the sharp side of things, like are you guys helping each other get money down? Are you at each other's throats and just kind of a race there's, to the top? There's a lot of parallels to the poker community. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. you, you guys get the Twitter spaces and the live streams. And meanwhile, we just kind of battle it out behind the scenes and take shots at people and things like that. Um, there's a lot of comp- competitive nature to it because everyone feels like, oh, there's just this one little edge and we all have to compete for it. Right. There's a lot of surface area. I used the word before, surface area. There's a lot of things out there to find an edge at. So for every edge that you find, there's probably nine more you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Now, do I want to tell you what all those edges are as a sharp sports better? No, I kind of want to keep my golden goose for itself. But there's there's just so much out there right now. Um, I think it's starting to change, though. Like, we started up a Discord, and I was against it. I was like, I do not want to run a Discord. It's going to devolve into people sniping at each other and everybody posting picks and trying to sell picks. And they were like, no, let's do it. Let's do it. Well, we did it, and it's... It's like, uh, what's that meme of like flying cars and a futuristic city? It's actually like that right now. Like people are actually supporting each other. They're trying to get each other better. And I'm like, is this the new wave coming? Like, are we actually turning the corner? If you share something, somebody's going to like give you something. Mm -hmm. And then like he just mentioned, sports books are losing money and they're spending marketing money. Like those bonuses they're offering, they earmark that as marketing money. Like they Mm -hmm. already wrote it off. Yeah. So some people like look down on bonus hustling, like, it takes no skill, but there's a lot of money in it. It's free money. Yeah, money in the like, streets. You bend over and exactly. pick it up. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. like, do it. And if you do it at a high level or you just get creative, you, you can make a lot of money. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. I don't think. The money's just as green. Right, exactly. right. If you made it from solving the NFL or just picking up uh, the free bonuses here at, you know, DraftKings and FanDuel, right. it's the, it spends just the same. Yeah. Is... Is fantasy sports the the wave of the future when it comes to sports betting? Like, I, I know that DFS was wildly popular for a while, and now it seems unbeatable for the vast majority, but there's still, you know, buckets of money being dumped into it. Uh, and now I see best ball is becoming wildly popular as well. Is, is this kind of the direction that people are taking since it's more gamified, and it seems like there aren't really any limits to the amount that you can get down? It's a gateway drug. Okay. <laughs> Cause here's the thing. In, in almost every state that has any kind of betting or game of skill, the barrier to entry, the, the legal age for DFS is 18. Right. The legal age for sports betting as a casino product basically is 21. Mm-hmm. So what does DraftKings and FanDuel do? They get you when you're 18 right. so that when you turn 21. I mean, it's when you mm-hmm. think about it, it's kind of sinister, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They make it so much like sports betting that when you turn 21, they go, well, well we got this big sports book right here, boys. Mm-hmm. Come on in. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that's what DFS is, the gateway drug. It is still a wild, wildly profitable pursuit for some people, but it's really tough to win at. Yeah. And now we have uh, the sites like Prize Picks and Underdog, which they're able to offer what's basically parlays for DFS, for player performance within a game. And they're able to offer that. And that kind of feels like sports betting, but it's classified as a game of skill. It's uh, under like the DFS carve out for UIGEA. And it's in California, it's in Texas, it's in Florida, it's in these huge states that don't have regulated sports betting yet. And that's booming for them because. That's the only type of sports betting you could possibly do because it's not really sports betting and it's taking off for them. And there's tons of money in that right now. So, it, it, yeah, it's I would say if, if it was a nine inning game of sports betting in the U.S., we're about in the third inning. Mm-hmm. There's still a lot of different ways this game could go. There's still a lot of things that could happen that to change things. Um, and we're just starting to realize now what it could become. Yeah, I, I think it's somebody from the outside looking in that doesn't do any betting at all. Fantasy is, uh, it's really compelling. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of seen it evolve from the original rotisserie baseball leagues where they were marking it by pen, looking at box scores every single day, all the way now to things like best ball where it's just set it and forget it. You know, you, you're yeah. literally just betting on your draft. Right. And that's, that's it. You're moving past it. So I imagine that that evolution isn't anywhere close to complete. And the ability to gamify betting is uh, so much more robust when you're talking about turning it into a game of Madden, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder how much of this gamification will start to carry over into traditional sports betting because it seems viable, right? Whether you're talking about doing it through parlays or... Uh, I mean, I guess like the in-game bets have become really popular. 
and the ability to do it on an app instantaneously has now kind of turned into the to the to the crack that people are looking for similar to slots they, i guess it didn't launch the better VR, like the micro betting yeah they so have it did it launch. in ohio how's, yeah. it, how's it going it's it's going well so that's the thing it's I, to do the call back to earlier in the hour i said what if right i'm always thinking what if well that's what i do with sports betting now what if we're doing more in-game betting we're doing this micro betting because here's the fallacy for um sports books you bet on a game and it's a three-hour game and you don't bet again that's not good for the sports book right but if they can get you to bet on every play if they can get you to bet on every pitch mm-hmm. now they have that frequency of betting and now it's more like a casino game mm-hmm. where you know a blackjack table has a very low house edge but they make that house edge because of volume and mm-hmm. that's what they're going to try to do to sports betting is make more higher volume uh higher frequency sports I betting that. i hate that so much but <laughs> it, it could be beatable gina right yeah but like it's ruining <laughs> it's ruining the experience of going to a game yes i think i, I agree and it's so addictive it's like playing candy crush <laughs> I, I'm not a fan of people losing their money to the casino. Like, I right, hate it. Right. And it does so... give you the volume and surface area that you're looking for, though, right? As professionals. And here's the thing. Sportsbooks want the action. So what we've noticed is we have all these in-game tools that help you kind of quantify your edge in-game. And the sportsbooks would limit you on the pregame stuff because they're like, right, well, that's right. where the sharps are. And they're being told by consultants, you got to have more in-game betting. So now we're giving them in-game betting, and they're like, yeah, yeah, bring it, bring it, bring it, please. Come on, more because they think that's where they need to be. They're not, they're not really smarter than the average person. They're just in this business, and now they're thinking, this is where our business needs to evolve to. Okay, we want all this action. They're not thinking sharp or square. They're just thinking, hey, we got now these volume numbers that we can tell to our shareholders mm-hmm. that we have all this extra liquidity, and they think it's good. And now we're kind of you know, picking off the edges there too. Yeah, <clears throat> that makes sense. I got a few questions. Good. Do you think ESPN bet is a positive for the betting community. Man, that came out of nowhere, right? Like I was setting up, we had a little meet and greet for our members and somebody walks in and goes, so Barstool's gone and ESPN bets in. I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I don't know, I was actually talking to some people from ESPN last night and they weren't sure, like they don't know. Now ESPN's been saying they want to get into this for years. Of course. And they've been working it into their coverage for the last couple of years. Oh yeah. They're putting like the odds in, they're putting live odds. They're like, they're working in it a lot. Yeah, so is it a positive? Will it bring in new bettors? I don't know. Is there people that don't know about sports that already go to the ESP or sports betting that already go to ESPN.com? I like I kind of feel like everyone knows sports betting's out there now, right? right? Yeah. yeah. And they're probably even annoyed by it. Like there's we got to that point that was the same thing with the DFS boom years ago. There was just so many commercials on your local sports broadcast that you're like, I don't want to go play at FanDuel because they they ram it down my throat all the time. Mm-hmm. I just, you know, leave me alone. And I think there's a lot of sports fans that think sports betting's the same way. They're kind of turned off by it by now. Mm-hmm. So ESPN, I'm not sure this is going to be a great play for them, but they finally did it, you know? Yeah. And it's, so we'll have to see what, what becomes of that. Look, Barstool was wildly successful because they have a demographic that wants to bet on sports. Yeah, and right. they just were like, come on, let's bet. I was, I was going to say, I wonder if there were internal conversations like with Disney. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah. Disney owns ESPN. Right. This, yeah, this yeah. Is, it can't be predatory. These, right, are, these yeah. are the details of what happened in this deal. Disney said, we will acquire you, Penn, if you drop Barstool. And only oh. if you drop Barstool. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Penn Gaming went to uh, back to Portnoy and said, we'll give it back to you. <laughs> but if you ever sell, we get 50% of the, the uh, profits that you sell for. And so basically, he got paid five hundred and fifty million, and then got his company back for free. And then got yeah. his company back three years later <laughs> so for amazing. free. Mark, and it was mainly because like, Disney wanted nothing to do okay. with Barstool. This yeah. is basically like the live golfers that left. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's so sick. So, and my other question. So, this one's actually from Efro. He says, "Can you ask if the twenty twenty election was the only time they had a market to bet large on something that was already final?" That's a good question. That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, of course, it's Efra. I'm sure there's <laughs> been situations, but that was bizarre. I mean, we covered it pretty well. But could you imagine getting Leia Price on the Super Bowl winner like a month after? <laughs> the <Yeah>. day? <laughs> right. They haven't visited the White House yeah. yet. It's not yeah. official. Yeah, exactly. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. So that was like the biggest one ever. I, or, I can't really only? think of anything in my mind where you could literally pass post. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. You know? But yeah, sports crazy. are pretty, pretty final. Sick. There, there isn't right. like a lot of debate. You don't get to go to a court. 
Yeah. And and determine who the it, winner it is. It is funny sure. when like you'll see like the the ref will like, you know, make a bad call and then like the team the the losing team will be like, "Oh, we're protesting this game." Like protest all you want. They're not changing the it's, final score. It's not final though. Like if you have a bet, uh, like a parlay, something like that and something crazy happens in a game, like what? Derek Hamlin. They'll keep it open. No, Turtle. they'll like oh. cancel your bet. Oh, they'll cancel. Okay. Right, mm-hmm. like if what happened with that? There was yeah, so the Demar Hamlin game yeah. where the guy had the oh, you know, heart that attack. One. Right, but yes. The so they canceled the game, mm-hmm. and there were people that had season wins that right, had right, already right. won. In other words, they were like, I think like Bills. Oh. He had like Bills. Uh, but they had to play enough games. Right, but right. They, the terms of the house rules say. Exactly. Right, you have to play this many games. Contingent on a 17-game season. And mm-hmm. even though he had already won the bet, it would it would have won they even They canceled if it. Right. They canceled it. Wow. And so he actually... This guy's mm-hmm. in Canada. He's a friend of ours. He's taking them to court, small claims court in Canada. Pretty and like, point. And like Caesars, like the book, hires all these big lawyers and they, you know, and small claims court in Canada, they're like, what you doing, eh? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need all these, uh, these lawyers, that is eh? That's a yeah. point, which yeah, yeah, I right. support. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah for sure. Crazy. That's wild. So what's on the roadmap for Unabated moving forward? Oh, man, we just have, we're just continuing to expand that surface area, right? So... We, the cool thing we have coming out is the big thing that's coming in sports betting, it's actually already here, is contests, mm-hmm. okay? You have the Circa contest here in Vegas, Circa Millions and Circa Survivor. You go on DraftKings, and they got all of these pool contests. You could join a contest where it's a guaranteed million. You put up $50,000. You play against, like, 22 other people, and it's a guaranteed million to the winner. Um, but we're building a tool that is for survivor contests. You know, survivor contests, you pick one team to win outright each week. You can't reuse that team as the season goes on. And whoever is the survivor at the end, whoever's the last man standing, whether that happens in like week 11 or to the end of the season, you win the whole pot. Everybody, you know, one person takes it all. The circle one is a huge, huge deal right. here. Eight million dollars guaranteed. Yeah, the circle wow. one. Was so, there yeah. an overlay last year? There was for a while. There was. Did it... I thought there was. There was an overlay in the millions last year and in Survivor the year before. And this year, he's raised the guarantee again, so there could be it's an probably, overlay. And you can get, and you could buy five entries, I think. It's was 10 like, this year. You can oh, buy really? 10 entries this year. We should do one for the podcast. Oh, oh, we should totally do many. Should. Yeah, yeah. We're we should do that. Because here's the deal. We have this survivor tool we're coming out with. It's going to be a couple of weeks. Yeah, we're sharp now. Yeah. And, <laughs> but, so it's, you know, the big thing in DFS, it's okay. The big thing in poker was the game theory optimal solvers, right? Mm-hmm. The big thing in DFS was uh, these lineup optimizers, okay? Right. They're using very similar math. We built one for sports betting for these survivor contests where you can create the optimal path and then you can kind of control it. Like you can say, you know what? We need to be a little bit more contrarian. So we're going to up the contrarian slider a little bit Mm -hmm. and it'll build out the optimal path for that. And then we get the results coming in each week from all of these major contests. We're integrated with DraftKings. We're going to get the circuit numbers, the runyourpool.com numbers, which is a a large site that just runs your pool. And we're going to get so you'll be able to kind of learn as it goes what the public is playing what the public has left and how that kind of affects your pool that you're in whether it be circa millions or your small you know 10 person pool and we'll be able to kind of restructure your path as you go because the thing with a survivor contest it's not to survive it's to be able to outlast your opponents and so you got to kind of be a little bit contrarian with them in order to get that swing yeah. Because two years ago for the circuit contest, there was like 22 people that won the whole thing. Right. Because mm-hmm. they, they all tied. They all got through uh, 18 weeks. And it, it, that wasn't optimal. That was a fluke that that happened. That's mm-hmm. probably not going to happen again. Right. Uh, but, it, you know, you, you need to be kind of contrarian enough to get that swing, to get the edge, outlast them. And so I think this tool is going to be really great well, for if, anybody. If a pool gets large yeah. enough, there, there has to be a point where a pool is large enough where a team getting through all 18 weeks seems to be probable, right? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I wrote an article about that for our site and you can kind of do this math of uh, take the power of a number and you, you kind of come up with, this is the probability, this is the week that it should end in. Right. And so like most pools don't make it 18. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So for circa millions, it's such a huge pool. Yes. Yeah, somebody's going to make it all the way through. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for, if you have a, a pool of like a hundred people, Probably like week 12 or so that right. you're going to, because there's always going to be one game where 73% of the people are all in the same, yeah. right. you know, yeah. whoever was the biggest point spread favorite that week, mm-hmm. and then, and then they, they, they lose outright, yeah. and then the pool's decimated, right. and that happens more than you think, so, yeah. Yeah. Does Unabated have any, like, plans to, like, go into, like, player stats and stuff like that, and, like, connect it to 
the lines and stuff. So we have a props odd screen, and what you can do is, you know, a lot of these DFS players, they build these projections, and they're super sharp because mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're in this all the time. And so they kind of calculate out the stats, and they make these projections. You can bring it to our site. We'll simulate it for you because a projection is a mean number, but a sports book's hanging a median number because they want basically, you know, 50-ish a percent. They don't care how far much over the total that you win by. It's just if you beat their number. So they, they hang a median. And how you reach a median is you run simulation so that you can find what the median result was in that simulation. Mm -hmm. And that's, so you kind of have to go apples to oranges to then bet it. And so we have those tools to do that. Um, and so, but in terms of like player stats and like, you know, you can look up how many yards Aaron Rodgers threw for. We don't have that because actually that, that's actually very expensive. Yeah. You have to contract with the NFL to get the official stats and Sport Radar, who's their vendor, or another vendor is actually Bet Genius, but it, it's something we don't need to spend on because gotcha. you can get it everywhere, right? Yeah, you go yeah, to ESPN, course. you can go to everywhere. Was, that kind of makes my point from earlier. Like, I'm not build, I'm not, I don't have my own projections, mm -hmm. but Unabated has a tool where I can buy third party projections that are good. Very good. And then I could simulate with those, and I don't. I'm, then you can build yourself, kind right, of. Right, but like, then what I like to do is like take multiple projections, like from trusted sites, mm -hmm. and then where is there agreement? Like gotcha. I'll take three sets. Oh, there's agreement there. Like I feel comfortable betting this. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm not. I don't even. I couldn't simulate without that tool. Right. I'd have no idea, but I know how to use it. Makes sense. Has cool. sports betting completely ruined the sports watching experience for you too? <laughs> I don't watch sports. Uh, yeah, I was going yeah, to ask if you ever, like, if you, if you just bet them and then, and then see I'll, the results. I'll, not I'll sweat watch it sometimes. Out. The guy, I have a partner, the guy that I work with mainly, and he's always sweating everything. And I'll get these texts, like, of an emotion, like, <laughs> God damn it, or something. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. I don't know what's going on. I yeah. guess we're not, like, doing well. If it's, <laughs> if it's like, down to the wire, I'll, I'll turn on the game. But usually mm -hmm. I just look at the results at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I, I was a sports fan growing up, and then I got into advantage gambling and computers and things like that, and I, I, I wasn't as much a sports fan anymore. And so I don't think I ever it ruined it for me. But here's the thing, like the WNBA, there's 12 teams in the WNBA. I'd set the over-under that I could name seven and a half of them, maybe. Yeah. I, but I bet on it. I bet right, on the right. WNBA. Mm -hmm. and right, I make, of course. I make pretty good money on the WNBA. It's a very inefficient market. Yeah. Uh, I don't... I don't watch any of the WNBA games. I'm right. sorry. I mean, women's sports is, is blowing up right now. Um, but I just know that there's numbers and there's market and there's market inefficiencies. And therefore, I'm going to bet it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, what sucks when you go to like a baseball game or something like that and you bet on it and then you have to sit there for nine innings, watch your team get absolutely <laughs> trashed. Let me tell you the cheat code. Go to UFC fights. It's mm. like four. It's fifteen minutes. The bet's over. Next fight. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a relatively inefficient market too. If if Usually I'm not mistaken, yeah. right? So yeah. I know this guy. He's one of the sharpest bookmakers in the world. He's offshore. He makes the numbers, and he said to me, "I don't even know how they make in-fight UFC numbers because anything can happen. There's just really anything could happen. Yeah. One random punch out of nowhere, a kick, the guy you know goes down. He's like." I don't even know why we offer this for betting. There's no way the lines anybody has an edge. There's so, so much. If you go offshore and look at like UFC lines, there's such a huge difference. There was a live line at one of the fights I went to, and I feel like the guy was like minus 50. It was something absurd, like minus 1,500. He lost because of the judges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, what? Yeah. What just happened? So, yeah, this seems pretty absurd. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to get you out of here on a very important question. I need, I need your honest answer. Are the Steelers winning the Super Bowl? This year? <laughs> <laughs> that was, I would encourage you to bet them at the right price. Okay. Yeah, right. there you go. So that's, that's all that matters. You mm -hmm. had EV. Okay, let's go with that. If you can find a, a great price on the Steelers, bet it. He's never going to get Over nine and a half wins. Back. Do we like that? Uh, so we have an NFL season simulator. You enter your ratings, mm -hmm. we'll simulate at the season 10,000 times, and we'll let you know if the over 9.5 has value, if the alternate over 7.5 or under 12.5 oh, has value. Oh, Unabated has their own projection. Wait. Unabated. Well, we have, we have Rufus. We have, right, Rufus have, we has have his. Projections. I was going to say, I can get on Madden and simulate. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, but no, yeah, it's, it's definitely like you, there's, there's value in the market, no matter if yeah, you yeah, think yeah. they're going over, you think they're going under. It's mm -hmm. all about the price, man. Uh, uh, see, this is, is why it, I don't is bet. Is it nine and a half I bet with my heart. Nine and a half or ten, I think. Mm -hmm. What? Ten? It is... Uh, 
I think it's nine and a half. Yeah, I think so too. All right. All right that's going to do it for us. Thank you two so much for joining us. I would love to have Thanks. you on again, uh, especially as the, the football season rolls in. I uh, can't get enough of this stuff, to be quite honest, especially not being sharp myself. Um, that's going to do it for us today. We're going to be back tomorrow. I think it's going to be an evening pod. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be playing at Bellagio during the day. Uh, we will cover all things Bally's Big Bet. Rumor is that uh, <laughs> Jason and Austin are going to square off again tomorrow, so we may be able to actually give a pre-show breakdown. Oh, God. Or maybe even live in-game breakdown. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> we'll see you guys at some point during the day tomorrow. Hey, Psychic, you did good today. Peace. Thanks, buddy. <laughs>